Welcome to Soundtrack People, a live queer oral history project sponsored by the UPC Equity and Inclusion Office. I'm your host, Michael V. Smith. I haven't changed. Coming to you from the beautiful unceded territory of the Selic Okanagan people. Each week we welcome a special guest and feature a new album as the prompt for the soundtrack of our lives. This week's selection was my first concert, the summer of 1984 in Ottawa. It's Cindy Lauper with her album, She's So Unusual. And to tell us where he was when is acting and directing sensation, Ryan G. Hines. Hi, Ryan. Hello, Welcome to... everybody. Hello, Welcome to Michael. Soundtrack. Hi. It's oh. lovely to be on Soundtrack. I'm so glad <laughs> you're here. Um, okay, so there's the queer toonie. Do you want uh, queens or bears? Uh, I'll take queens, please. It's queens. You get to go first. Great, 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 great. Uh, so picture it. I'm four, five years old, kind of spanning those ages. I grew up in Mississauga, Ontario. If you're not familiar with Ontario, Mississauga is just outside of Toronto, but physically it's about mm, four years behind Toronto uh, and the rest of the world. Uh, so uh, growing up in Mississauga was a weird kind of combination of late 70s culture with uh, 80s culture. Um, it was also a surprisingly like culturally diverse place as well, but that's a conversation for another time. Anyway, uh, growing up in the 80s, the question was, are you a Madonna person or are you a Cyndi Lauper person? And for me, Cindy, Cindy was where it was at. Cindy was the influence. Madonna might have been like the popular one, but you know, popularity was never a thing with me. I like what Cindy was serving. And uh, when I think about She's So Unusual, and I think about how those songs make me feel and where I was and who I was with, more than anything else, it takes me right back to Mississauga. It takes me right back to being four and five years old, kind of at the at the beginning, middle of the 80s, uh, more towards the middle of the 80s. Uh, but it takes me right back there. And uh, the, the piece that I wrote is very much based on that and based on the people I remember and the things I, uh, I experienced. So, <clears throat> she's so friendly, it's the suburban way. He's so cute, like so cute. She's so busy, hands full with four kids, all boys. She's so, I don't know how to say it. We're both too young to know the word conservative, but that's what she is. So that. He's so mean, not like me at all. He's so shy, kind of like me. She's so cool, funny and popular and good at things and pretty and all the things cool kids are. We live across the street from each other, so we're always at each other's houses. Mine is quieter because it's just me and my mom, but hers has both of her parents, her six brothers and sisters, and a VCR and movie setup and records and tapes. We dress up and she doesn't care if I wear the dresses or play with the pom-poms and barrettes. She puts fun music on and the best is so unusual. It makes me wanna dance and laugh and cry and sing and wear crazy colors and do funny voices and have fun, even though I'm not a girl, whatever that means. And to be honest, I have no idea what any of it means until her mom takes it away because we're too young. But it was too late. It already took it was already in my head. It was already in my body. I'm five years old and I can do the best Betty Boop impression of all the kids on my block. I'm five years old and I already know that money changes everything. I'm five years old, curious about the danger zone, even if I don't know 
why it's dangerous and why I shouldn't mess with it. I'm five years old and already people notice words like he or she don't really seem applicable to me. What they notice and say and write and whisper and tease and attack and praise is that I'm so unusual. Amazing. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. And thank thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Cindy Lopper, <laughs> for the gift of voice. That album. <laughs> yeah. yeah, giving us voice to help frame who we are, how we know, how we move through the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's I'm gonna do mine and then we're gonna have a talk. Okay. So she's so unusual. In the summer between junior high and St. Lawrence, the siblings of two of my besties, Matthew and Dana, arranged tickets for us to see Cindy at the Ottawa X in the same auditorium I'd watch the Cornwall Royals play junior A hockey after they switched from the QMJHL to the OHL. On our way to Ottawa, we rendezvoused with more friends of my friend's older siblings at a farmhouse in Apple Hill which is as rural as it sounds, an intersection someone called a town. That third teenager also had a younger brother in tow, a pale blonde boy our age with creamy skin, dark eyes, and a good haircut messy with goop. We all rode seatless to Ottawa in the back of a white rental van my parents wouldn't have allowed. In the Civic Center, we stood not 20 feet from the stage on the floor of the stadium where I'd watch Howard Chuck Crawford, and Gilmore skate. For exhibition games, we'd gather in the basement of the Cornwall Burger King for a fast Whopper Jr. with fries, then load onto a coach for the hour's drive to the arena. I love the speed and violence of the games, the bodies of those young men checking each other into the boards, the scrunched look on their faces for a split second before tearing off in a different direction like superheroes which is also what made arenas a danger for boys like me. Hockey players are the cheese of a heteronormative mousetrap. The whole system is out to kill you, but you still desire that fast skating mullet with the thick fingers. The stadium that night waiting for Cindy probably played some part in a shoving match between a mother with a preteen daughter and a teenage girl with long green hair. I'd never before seen women be violent like this outside of a home. The opening act was none other than the Bangles, though this tour must have made them because none of us knew who they were until later that fall when their video with Leonard Nimoy appeared on video hits. The tune was going down to Liverpool. I had to look it up because I didn't remember. I don't recognize any of the song. So there's proof in that pudding. Cindy probably half my current age. In her signature layers of skirts and beads, we all knew Madonna stole from her. She bopped on six foot tall speakers right above our heads. Matthew, Dana, and I wouldn't be out of the closet for another six years, but this is one of my queerest moments before I came out. I'd gone to the city without adults for the first time. I was with my not yet boyfriend. And Cindy was Cindy, this radiant transgressive imp swooning love songs written by Prince. Everything in that 80s synth pop alternative hair dyed look felt like resistance, a fun, playful, countercultural fuck you to norm core Reaganism. My favorite moment is back with the boy in the farmhouse. Sitting him at the kitchen table to get ready, his sister applied a piece of scotch tape across either of his cheeks then used a light finger under his chin to move his head from side to side, applying a hot pink blush thick across his Dutch cheekbones. When she removed the tape, it left a stripe the color of his skin down the center of all that fresh hot pink, which is a memory I stored away two decades until I used it myself go-go dancing for a queer punk band. That boy's skin, his punky cheek, giving me a look, into the queer future. Yay, there we go. I love it, I love it, I love it. I love how how we both felt the need to invoke 
Madonna, Louise, <laughs> Verona, Veronica Chacon. She always shows up in conversations about Cindy. <laughs> I'm sorry I dissed Madonna, but it's true. Like we saw Madonna and we were like, what are you doing? You've stole, you just turned that look black. That's all. Yeah. Taking all the yeah. color out and did everything else. Which is what she did to Vogue. So, you know, it just, it's all a circle, really. <laughs> right? We should have seen the writing on the wall from the beginning. I, I also, wanna, go ahead, go ahead. I want to talk to you about growing up in Mississauga. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Well, it's it's funny because at the time, I I did feel, I felt I, isolated. I felt like I was the only person of me. But with the passage of, passage of time, I look back and I was like, no, I was a kid with queer friends. I was a kid who went to school with an incredible amount of racial and cultural diversity. So was I just being dramatic? And <laughs> I think that that might be that might be the case where growing up in, um, in Mississauga uh, was concerned. Because looking back, although sometimes I felt like I was the only one of whatever whatever I felt like, I also had a lot of fun. And I think about my memories there and it's always with friends. It's always, uh, always with uh, uh, people that I felt safe with. So rarely did I feel like uh, I was being attacked or othered until I kind of left my street in, in Mississauga. If I went to another neighborhood, that would happen. And once, you know, you get older and you start going to different schools and that began to happen. But the, the neighborhood where I grew up in Mississauga, I felt very, very safe. And I had a, a very, um, uh, very fun, social, uh, diverse, uh, diverse childhood. Uh, and I, I mean that uh, like culturally as well. Uh, we can talk about, you know, Cindy versus Madonna, but like Prince versus MJ was also a conversation uh, in my house. Strangely, my mom, my mom always called Prince the werewolf Michael Jackson <laughs> because he had more hair. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and so it's 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 I, I look back at Mississauga with with a lot of fondness at the time and growing up. All I wanted to do was get out and see the world and prove myself a bit. And now that I'm kind of on the north side of 40, I don't mind going back and visiting and 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 seeing my friends there and seeing my family there and and being places where, where I used to go. It's quite fun. I enjoy it. Well, I always thought like growing up in Cornwall, we didn't have a lot of money, so we didn't go to the city very much. I went to the city with school groups and my grandparents would bring me to the parliament buildings. But so we were an hour from anything big it was wasn't you couldn't just go to a gay bar and I always thought if you grew up in the suburbs it'd be so easy to come out because you just slip downtown and there's queer people everywhere <laughs> is that true well you, my starting from grade one my music teacher was an obviously gay man Sean O'Reilly I'll never forget him bright blue eyes Mr. O'Reilly um you could see the gay from a mile away before I knew really what gay meant. I knew that that was that was it. It, it was that guy. Um, but I look back on, on, on the music education he gave us all. And, you know, at 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 seven years old, he was sharing Into the Woods with us, the, the original Broadway cast recording of Into the Woods. He was sharing Sinead O'Connor. By the time I got to middle school, we knew who she had, who, who Sinead was, and we knew we knew her music. So, I, I'm I'm very grateful that that the gay was not just present in my life, but educational in my life, showing me showing me the culture without being like as an adult queer, you're going to need to know this. Just you know, introducing it into all of our lives gently. Yeah, that it's. I'm so glad you said that. When I moved to Toronto, we didn't get out very much. So I didn't know anything about food. I didn't know, like somebody tried to feed me a falafel and I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and I didn't know anything about culture. Like my parents had maybe a dozen albums and I didn't, so I didn't know about music. I didn't know about theater. I'd never been to a play that wasn't in a high school production. Mm -hmm. I, oh, except with cats. I went to cats in Ottawa. My Ms. Millette, our drama teacher, brought us to see cats. So, you know, that was a big deal. We were supposed to like it. 
<laughs> so, um, I, I also went to Cats as a kid, and for me, it changed my life in a good way, which I don't think is always true of people who see Cats. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I know when when I noticed when I moved to Toronto, I had to do a lot of catch up because people in my classes were middle class kids who'd grown up in cities or at least grown up close enough to a city that their parents brought them to things and I really didn't have a clue about anything so I've known that lately I've been thinking about the way in which my climb into queerness was also a climb away from um, my blue collar background like it was a class mm -hmm. climb as well as a queer climb and that's mm -hmm. been super interesting I hadn't really thought of that before but you didn't have that experience. You were sort of born into queerness. Yeah, I was. Uh, so I'm I'm mixed. Uh, my mom was Irish, and my uh, my dad is Dominican. And when they were when they were getting married in the '70s, uh, my mom uh, got letters from parents of her friends saying, "What you're doing, marrying outside of your race, is sinful, and this is why I'm not coming to your wedding, and I'm not letting my child come to your wedding." And so. Whoa. From from the, from the very from the second that she started her own family, my mom understood what difference meant, and she understood what it meant to uh, when just your existence, your day to day life, is perceived as a, as a threat or as something evil to to somebody else when it's not. So by the time she had me, I think she was really intent on giving me uh, a safe flower bed from which to grow. Um, I was, uh, like I said, I was an obviously queer kid. I had a, an extremely high voice. I was, uh, you know, wearing my mother's clothes and totting, totting around in her shoes and slippers uh, from a very, very early age, but it was never criticized. It was never looked down upon. I, it, my mom really made me feel safe uh, 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 and welcome to do those things. So I feel very fortunate. I, ha I, had, a, I had a good grounding as a, uh, as a as a queer. The rough stuff came later after I grew up, but <laughs> we won't get into that. <laughs> and do you see that play out in your life? Like, do you see that kind of acceptance and security at, at being at odds with other people's experience? Like, like it strikes me that um, having grown up in a milieu that really was super not queer, I was terrified to go into my first gay bar, like mm -hmm. shaking before I went in. And I just had a big chip on my shoulder and you probably didn't have that. So I, I'm just guessing that you'd walk into a room and be like, what's wrong with everybody? Like, I was, I was, I was 14 when I walked into my first gay bar, Michael. I I was chomping of at the Of course you were. Chomping at the bit to get into that gay bar. I I started my 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 nightlifing fairly young because it 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 uh, just seems so so exciting to me and so fun. Um there's a there's a fair, famous uh, story in my family. Um my mom uh, uh once a month would be like there's these plays running downtown. I can take you to this play or this play and she would give me the choice so that summer uh that i was 14 uh uh she said uh i can take you to little shop of horrors or la cajo fall now i knew what la cajo fall was when i was 14. so i said obviously please take me to, to la cajo fall so we went but it wasn't la cajo fall the musical it was a drag bar on young street called la cage and once we got there, we were already there, so there was nothing to do but go in and and and, and, and enjoy the show. And you know that that sold me. I just I, I got a taste of it, and I was like, I gotta have more of this. So against the knowledge and probably approval of my mother, I started clubbing when I was very very young. And unlike you, like I wasn't shaking in fear. I was like vibing with excitement. I was I, I was ready to get in there and, and ready to discover and play. Man, I wish I'd have met you. You you would <laughs> you would have been a lot of fun. I would have gotten you in no problem. <laughs> Amazingly, that's our twenty minutes, Ryan. What? <laughs> I know. Isn't that crazy? Do you have a last a last thought you want to add? 
Uh, just that uh, Cindy Lauper's music has always been about celebrating individuality and your your uniqueness and literally your singular voice. When you think of Cindy, you hear the voice, you see the creative vision, and that's something to be admired and celebrated. And it set a lot of us on our paths. Yeah, well, it's I love that. I love her for that. I love how much permission she gave me to be a weirdo. Mm -hmm. That that's you know like the genius of Cindy Lauper. Thank you, yeah. Cindy Lauper. Thank you, Cindy. And, <laughs> and thank you, Ryan. Thanks for joining us this week. Let's all give Ryan thank you, a warm. Michael. Thank you. Thank you. A big warm thank you of applause. If you haven't already, check out our Facebook event page or the soundtrack group for more on Ryan. Ryan's website is listed there. Um, check it out to see when Ryan might be performing in your town. Fingers uh, crossed. I want to get back on the road post pandemic as soon as possible. Yeah, let's hope. I need to thank um, also the UBC Equity and Inclusion Office and the Faculty of Creative and Critical Studies for sponsoring this event and our great friends here in Kelowna, the Inspired Word Cafe. Check out their podcast. They have amazing writers and artists on their show. We'll see you all next week for our last episode with Zoe Whittle. Thanks, everyone. Mwah.